So welcome to Ukraine. Uh, we you. are really glad that you that you and the other guys came because basically the um, the Ukrainian defense community reads all of you guys every day. It's one of the super important sources of, of thoughts, of information, and of uh, for the whole community. So. I think many people, many serious people in this defense community starts the day with not this coffee, but someone, but something that uh, you guys do for this, for this regard. So you're a very interesting aspect for this war. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about your you know, opinions of very basic things that actually, actually can provide us with profound you know, thoughts about this. For instance, you know, we've been seeing these reports from, um, from the US uh, media saying that according to the US intelligence Ukrainian military might be um, might have all chances to take Kherson for instance within the next six weeks how do you feel about this well first thank you for having me and uh, it, thank you for saying what you said earlier it's uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to think of a more important audience these days when you run a publication about mm -hmm. war and strategy and defense than a country that's at war in one of the biggest wars uh, in, in history during the 20th century since World War II. Um, to answer your question, uh, I've, I've never been to Kyrgyzstan. I'm reading a lot, of, probably have access to less information than you do, but uh, it does definitely seem possible. And I think given a lot of the signals that are being sent from the senior Russian commander mm -hmm. about taking difficult decisions, the evacuation of civilians, yeah. the formation of barge bridges and things like that, uh, I, it does seem mm -hmm. that they are ready to cross, uh, vacate that, that side of the river and that mm -hmm. uh, and Ukrainian forces will be able to liberate. You know, over the last, let's say, a month, uh, since basically September, we've been seeing quite a few successful Ukrainian operations on the front line with Kherson, um, it's Kharkiv, very impressive. Um, of course, on the Ukrainian morale, the effect is absolutely joyful. Of course, it, it bumps up morale, it uh, gives us a very good reason to explain why it matters, why you know, helping Ukraine matters, why, why this whole you know, um, war effort matters, and why it's you know, actually close to this war. But what about the U.S. environment, political, uh, political system, media? Uh, I'm sure you know the U.S. media study all those things very closely because we we are very impressed with the amount of attention that we get. Do those things have actual impact on the U.S. readiness to go on? Uh, do these things prove it that supporting Ukraine actually works and you have tangible results? Yes, I think it's really important. Had, had Ukraine not had that major operational breakthrough around Kharkiv and, and showing success now around Kherson, I think that, uh, that Western support, political support for continued material support and intelligence support would be on uh, a thinner read. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the, that victory was really important to not just sustaining Western support, but, but increasing it. Uh, because had things sort of just developed into the mm -hmm. static war of attrition, or, or the lines not moved much, or if there had been more Russian successes, then I think that there would be more pressure from Washington on Kyiv mm -hmm. to negotiate. There would be more pressure in the form of we can't keep doing this forever sorts of things. Yeah. So that, made, that breakthrough on Kharkiv, which I know was co-planned with, with U.S. Yeah. planners according to media reports, I think was really important for, what the, for the Western uh, coalition backing Ukraine. So it's like in business, you have to be shown results, tangible you know, results on the ground. But can you please explain to us, because it's, sometimes it's really confusing, uh, as the elections are coming soon in the U.S., midterm elections, as far as I understand, uh, what's the um, position um, of the Republican Party that is, might be expected to gain a better result uh, in, the, in these elections? Yeah. So, because we have, we've been hearing conflicting voices about the, uh, the Republican support <coughs> towards Ukraine. What's the So we're situation? having our midterm elections, and what, the way it's looking is, is mm -hmm. that uh, the Republicans will probably take back control of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And as far as the control of the Senate, it's up in the air. I would put it at 50-50. The Democrats mm -hmm. maintain control, 50-50 the Republicans uh, gain control back. Uh, and the important thing to understand about the Republican Party these days in this post-Trump era is that it is very much in two factions when it comes to foreign mm -hmm. policy. There is the sort of more hawkish coalition mm -hmm. that's very influenced by the old neoconservative ideas and. Uh, in very forward-leaning defense, extremely well-funded military, and extreme involvement in foreign conflicts. Whereas the other side of the Republican Party, yes, for very high defense spending as well, but much more restraint-oriented mm -hmm. and much, uh, especially not very favorably disposed towards NATO 
and causes that involve NATO. And of course, Ukraine is not a NATO member, but this is very much a NATO coalition backing Ukraine and its efforts to defend its territory and expel invaders. So I think when Republicans come into office, we should expect to see a lot more oversight, mm -hmm. uh, especially from the House side and House committees on the aid to Ukraine and how it's being spent and any questions about corruption. Uh, there, will, there will basically be more uh, Republicans looking for levers they can press that mm -hmm. might result in less aid going to Ukraine in the future. And I'm of the view that this war can last for quite a while, and I think this is something that actually mm -hmm. Kiev should be very concerned about mm -hmm. in terms of the coalition of, of Western support. Yeah, so we should be worried, kind of. I think so, yes. Because yeah. uh, if you look at the opinion polls closely, mm -hmm. while there is a lot of support for Ukraine, if you just ask the okay. question simply, if you dig in and ask more detailed questions such as, are you for you supporting Ukraine mm -hmm. until the last inch of Ukrainian mm -hmm. territory is liberated, uh, or, or as long as it takes, then you start seeing where support mm -hmm. diminishing. Can you please elaborate, because we've been seeing in this thing in the news that over 70% of Americans do support Ukraine and they stand for you know, continuing support. Um, what's the you know, fractions within this uh, part of people that actually supports? So I don't, I don't have the numbers in front mm -hmm. of me or on the top of my head right now, but, I, I, but just I would repeat my earlier point is when you ask specific, about more specific scenarios, such mm -hmm. as do you support Ukraine as long as it takes until every inch of territory or until Crimea is liberated, then you might mm -hmm. see support not go down but a 50%. It's still a minority, but it's a smaller, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's still a majority, but it's a smaller majority. And I think if you then have a Republican governing, you know, a Republicans in Congress and then maybe a Republican president wins the next election and this war could easily go on that long, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and since, since foreign policy in American politics is very much an elite-led sport, mm -hmm. and by that I mean you have opinion makers and politicians really determining the sway of where voters think and how they think mm -hmm. about issues. You saw this when Trump came to power and then Republican support for NATO dropped, for example. It's not because they objectively changed their view mm -hmm. about NATO, it's because elite-led opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the danger for Ukraine is if Republicans gain more political control and those mm -hmm. Republicans who are not, who are more uneasy about supporting Ukraine or less enthusiastic about supporting Ukraine, pushing the American population in the other mm -hmm. direction, particularly if this war drags on for another couple years or more. You know, I generally expected the whole Ukrainian story, you know, the situation to get out of Western attention, public attention, I mean, after, let's say, a couple of months maybe, because people tend to, to be acting like this, you know, um, you know, things that were bright, they slip out of attention. But still, um, almost nine months after the, uh, the launch of the big invasion, Ukraine, as far as I understand, remains one of the, one of the focus points uh, in, uh, in the U.S. and also in many other countries. And, you know, Ukraine still matters and worries people um, in, the US, in the U.S. Why do you think that's happening? Is there something that... Uh, you know, triggers some values in the American people, or why is it so still interesting? I think there's lots of different aspects mm -hmm. to it. One is the scale, mm -hmm. uh, the, just the pure scale of this war, largest war since World War II. Most people alive have never seen anything like this before. I think that's the most important aspect of it. Uh, two, I also think it's important, while we've seen major, many wars, you know, other wars that have caused large amounts of deaths, particularly the Syrian civil war, which, uh, you know, didn't, which certainly got a lot of attention, but mm -hmm. not on the scale that Ukraine is currently getting. Uh, but that was a civil war. Civil wars by their nature are much harder for larger people, mm -hmm. you know, for normal people to understand, unless you follow it extremely closely. Is that, you know, in the Syrian civil war, how many factions were there? Like yeah. at least five, you know? And that's, that's very complicated. And uh, it doesn't build an easy narrative. Whereas with this war, this is a much simpler narrative. It's mm -hmm. one state attacking another. Uh, and that's a, a much clearer story and I think one that it's easier for people to get involved in it and become and feel personally involved in it. Uh, two, you know, huge Ukrainian and Eastern European communities in the United States and there have been for many years and that's another part of it. So I think there's that affinity from these ethnic groups in the United States and also I think it matters to be frank and some people write this off to racism but whatever you want to call it is it's that because it's a European country and a Western country, which is the political tradition and ethnic tradition that most, most Americans come from. I think there's just more identification with it as well. Do you think we should be expecting uh, Ukraine to be still, you know, still in, the, in the spotlight, let's say six months after this moment? 
Say that again, sorry. Um, do you think we should expect Ukraine to be in the focus, in the very focus of the U.S. intention within the uh, next six months, let's say? I don't know. I think that uh, it really depends on the, the nature of the war. If there are more major Ukrainian operational successes, for example, in Kyrgyzstan mm -hmm. or Zaporizhia or other parts of the country, I think those are the sorts of things that sustain and fuel further more U.S. support and engagement. Uh, but I think that it will be very hard to, to keep this level mm -hmm. of high interest and uh, enthusiasm for much longer. Particularly, the, the, the danger, I think, is that uh, people will start focusing on the more negative consequences, particularly mm -hmm. if Europe dips into a deep recession this winter, which many people predict that it will. I'm not an economist, this mm -hmm. isn't my area, but I read economists, mm -hmm. uh, which itself is a bit risky. But, um, so I think that the negative aspects of the war might start to draw more attention from Western policymakers and become more politically salient. So based on this assessment and also many other things that we see in this war, I, I get it that it's absolutely not in Ukrainian interest to let this war drag on, to let it be uh, um, continuous, you know, uh, protracted. So I think it's better for us to finish it as soon as possible, um, probably at some price, maybe at not go into the full victory before, you know, we lose one of the most important aspects uh, behind, uh, behind the victory, which is the Western support, particularly the US support. Do you think so? Well, for, first let me clarify something I said. I said the negative aspects of the war. Obviously the war has many negative aspects. Mm -hmm. I meant in terms of how Western mm -hmm. policymakers view negative aspects on their own country mm -hmm. is what I meant to say. But the, um, to answer your question, it might be true, but it, it, it's, it's not clear that it's under anyone's control right now. These mm -hmm. sorts of major wars tend to be decided not by any one particular battle or series of particular battles, but it's determined by the will and ability of each side to stay in the fight and endure financially, logistically, in terms of supply, in terms of morale, mm -hmm. in terms of manpower. So these are the things that it comes down to, which speaks to the possibility for a much mm -hmm. larger war. I think the best chance is that we have for this ending more quickly uh, would be the collapse of the Putin regime somehow. But uh, I'm not sure how likely that is, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. And probably the last and um, the simplest question. Uh, from my perspective, what, what I see on social media, on Twitter, for instance, I see that many people in the U.S. speak about you know, nuclear threats and you know, the possibility of a nuclear holocaust. And uh, the question is, how many people actually scared uh, about such a possibility? So They are, and I, I think that uh, it's, as someone that works on foreign policy and mm -hmm. defense issues for a living, it's the question that I get asked most often mm -hmm. by my sort of normal friends and family who are not involved in this field or studying this or following it extremely closely. And that's the question that I get asked the most. So I think mm -hmm. that, um, it would be a mistake for people in Kyiv to write this off as an insincere mm -hmm. threat, uh, concern or a, a, as like America deterring itself. I mean, deterrent, this, is the, this is what's great about deterrence is it works mm -hmm. when you're deterring your enemy, but it's less fun when you're being deterred, right? Uh, and that's the nature of deterrence is it's a double-edged sword. You know, the, the other day, President Biden said that we are facing the situation that is the worst since Cuban Missile Crisis in terms of, you know, nuclear, nuclear uh, war, war threat situation. Do you think that's, uh, that's the correct assessment? I don't know if that's true. Uh, part of it is just hard to answer because so many relevant records from the 80s especially haven't been mm -hmm. declassified. But I think we got closer to nuclear war in the 80s probably mm -hmm. at least once. And I think that uh, my view is, and of when I can put, put piece together from open sources, we actually came very close to nuclear war with North Korea and the Trump yeah. administration, much more close than most people understand. So why so many emotions about this, especially at that level? Well, when it, when it, because with Ukraine, it's all out in the open. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't something that's happening sort of like, you know, most people in America didn't know about Abel Archer during the 80s. This mm -hmm. is something that ha happened, we only figured, found out much later with North Korea. A lot of this was happening behind the scenes. The records haven't been declassified. This hasn't happened in the open. With Ukraine, this is playing out for the entire world mm -hmm. to see intentionally. You know, Putin's making these public threats very intentionally. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why there's this level of concern. Yeah, so let's hope that would never be like a real case scenario. Hey man, I'm action. right there with you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all on this together. Yeah, I mean, uh, nuclear, no one wins nuclear wars, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think, what I worry about is nuclear use does not solve mm 
mm -hmm. any of Putin's problems. But what I worry about is that he would still do it anyway because he's such a poor judge of mm -hmm. how the politics of Western countries works that he thinks that he can do things without mm -hmm. certain responses. Uh, so I think that he, I, I, I worry that he believes he can get away mm -hmm. with tactical, tactical quote unquote mm -hmm. nuclear use. Uh, and doesn't understand the immense global consequences that Russia would face, much greater than what they've already faced now. And to me, and the worst aspect behind this is that you can't actually back down to prevent that, from, from, from my understanding. If you back down to um, you know, nuclear blackmail, you only make the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons more likely. Well, you, you can back down. It, it really depends on, and not to get academic, is whether you accept the sort of spiral model. In or this situation, I mean, I mean, this situation. This is not the Cuban Missile Crisis in which you know both sides back down, reach to a wise compromise in good faith. We have a quite different situation as far well, as I in understand. Well, the Cuban it. Missile Crisis, I think the, the nature of compromise being reached mm -hmm. is overrated. I think the Soviet Union really did back down in that yeah. example. So I think that works into the opposite. But. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I guess we'll see. Uh, these are very fraught conversations. Obviously, I don't want to be someone that just shows up in mm -hmm. Kiev and says, this is the situation where the mm -hmm. West would stop backing you and this is how mm -hmm. you should handle negotiations with Russia. That's not my role. Um, I'm, uh, I just hope we can help people better understand what's happening and, and, uh, and you know, including, mm -hmm. which includes also reading the great work that you do. Which is, which is exactly what has happened with this interview. Yeah. So thank you all for this. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Great, thank you for your time. Thank you.